I'm lucky to be alive right now after all of this. Everyone, welcome to the Infestation documentary. My name is Adam Nodler. I've been investigating the paranormal now for 15 years on and off, the last 10 years more seriously. In my course as a paranormal investigator, I've been to 54 different haunted places multiple times. I've been to many scary locations and have had many disturbing events in those investigations. And what I'm about to tell you right now is the scariest thing that I've ever encountered in my life. This is the absolute worst time in my life. So beginning, beginning in September of 2021, I was starting to have a lot of mysterious problems. They started off as physical. My, and I was going to the hospital numerous times. The first time I went to the hospital, um, there was, in my body, it felt like there was an organ part that was about to rupture. And, you know, I was doing Google research and all that, and, you know, I thought it was like my spleen. But of course, the Google images, they, with what they were showing me, I was like, okay, my spleen's not enlarged. But my head just kept telling me, telling me to go to the doctor. Um, because like I said, it just felt like there was an organ part inside of me that was ready to burst. Um, so you go to urgent care, get all these tests done and, you know, blood tests, urine tests, um, x-rays, CT scans, and mysteriously, they find nothing. Nothing was wrong with me. But what they did find was just a small chiropractic problem. So with that being said, I just went to the chiropractor. They popped a part of my back that was out of place and that was the end of it. Then, about a week later, I was getting this swelling feeling in my genitalia, very uncomfortable and it was starting to get painful and I was fearful that it may be cancer. <laughs> So, a few days goes by, there's no improvements, so I go back to the urgent care facility. They do an ultrasound to see if they could find any tumors in that area. And, you know, I'm sitting there worried in the, in the room where I'm in. Doctor comes in, nothing. No tumors, you're fine. And of course, that was a gigantic relief. And sure enough, as soon as I walk out of that hospital door, all of a sudden the pain's gone, like it never happened. And then a week later, I was going to bed and I was getting shocks in my chest, like these electric shocks. I wake up the next morning and I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna have a heart attack. Like my chest is just tensing up. My heart doesn't feel good. I feel like I'm about to keel over. And of course, looking up, you know, hopping on the search engine again to see what's going on. I mean, some stuff checked out for a heart attack, some stuff didn't. And this progressively got worse over the day. So I'm like, okay, I gotta go back to urban care again. And on the way there, as I'm driving my car, I felt feel like I'm gonna lose control of the car and crash because my chest is hurting so bad. So as soon as I walk into the urgent care facility, you know, I'm not gonna hear for appointment, but I just, you know, I'm sorry, you, you gotta call an ambulance. I'm about to collapse on the floor here. So they do that. Um, they rush me to the ER and they're doing all these tests. Um, they take vital signs. The thing was, vital signs show nothing. Like everything was good with my vital signs. More blood work's being done. Um, X-rays being done again. And they find nothing. There's a heart attack test that you can take and there's like the highest. 
the score you get for this test to qualify for a heart attack is a 45. Mine was a six. It, like it wasn't even close. Um, so, and then once again, I leave the emergency room and like it never happened. Like the pain was gone and everything. Um, so that week after that incident, um, just sitting on my couch at home doing some work, but then start ruminating too much. I'm like, okay, Adam, you need to leave the house and do something, not have this, these uh, health, create these health situations in your head. You got to go do something. So I do. It's, there was a mausoleum that I wanted to check out, and through my experience as a paranormal investigator, I just go to these graveyards, these mausoleums, to tune up my instincts and see what I can feel from spirit as I walk around these places. Um, so I go to this mausoleum, and, you know, it's about eight stories high, and there's just all kind. I mean, it's cool to look at, but when you walk in there, it's... You get the sense that something's going on at this particular place. Um, before, I was trying to get in contact with this mortuary regarding shooting footage at their mausoleum for walks amongst the dead. Um, one of my YouTube videos that I do. And they declined, and you know, as a paranormal investigator trying to get stuff done, you don't take no for an answer, so you just keep pushing. And they said, sorry, Adam, we can't do it. So, um, you know, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't going there to film anything, but, you know, I was just gonna walk around that mausoleum to tune up my instincts as I do. And I get to the lower parts of the mausoleum, it starts to get darker, creepier. And there was caution tape at this one part on the second floor, I believe it was. And my instinct was telling me, why is there caution tape? Like, blocking off this corridor of the mausoleum. So, I mean, sometimes as paranormal investigators, you gotta go, go past the red tape, so to speak, and then proceed. So that's what I did. And I go down the corridor, turn one, another corridor, and then there's this another corridor, it just got super dark and creepy. And it was right here and there that you know, my sixth sense kicked in and said, Adam, you gotta go right now. It's time to leave. Something's not right. Get out of the mausoleum right now. So I do that. And, you know, I've got some floors to go up. Um, the exit is like on the fifth floor, so I had to run up some stairs on the third, fourth, and fifth floor, and there's a lot of hall. The corridors are long, and so there's a lot of walking to do to get out of there. So I get out, get in my car, and I start to head to the gym afterwards. And it was right there on the Selwood Bridge that I was driving on, where it was like, whoa, like what the hell is that? Like this, whatever this energy is, it's not me. And it came along with a sting, a sting sensation in my urethra that hurt. I thought like, what, did a bee get in my pants or something? No, I didn't see anything, but it was just like, all of a sudden, there was this anger and anxiety out of nowhere. It was like anger and anxiety on steroids, basically. So when I walked into the gym that day, I mean, I don't really talk to anybody, but I mean, I'm not, like, I don't hate anybody there either. It's just, that's just me for the most part. I just keep to myself in the gym. And the people who usually see me there could tell that I was, like who the like who is that guy? They know who I am, but they can kind of see that something's wrong with me. And this is starting. This is really freaking me out now. So as I'm working out, I'm like, oh god. Like as paranormal investigators, we're always supposed to disengage from spirit upon ending an investigation. As I walked out of that mausoleum, I don't think I did that. Upon ending any kind of spirit communication, say goodbye, end, ending EVP session, or whatever it is that you're doing, or, you know, and also call upon, say, the Archangel Michael for protection. I don't think I did any of those things. 
So that crossed my mind. I was like, oh my God, I have an attachment. And this is bad. This is, I've had attachments before, but this one's really bad. So I was scared to get a reading because I was worried that it was not going to be picked up on and that it was just all in my head, basically. Um, so these next few weeks, um, I'm just, I'm working with this high anxiety and, and anger. And all of a sudden, I start getting the absolute worst intrusive thoughts I've ever had in my life that were just so overwhelming. And in this time period, my empathy totally plummeted. And I'm a very empathic guy. So all of a sudden, I love animals. I'm getting images of hurting animals, to be specific, little kittens. And that was extremely heartbreaking for me. Um, I, I love women. I'm getting images of beating women to death. And this just burns a hole in your soul. Um, I'm getting submissive, abusive, sexual images of me and me enjoying it, and it was just absolutely disturbing. And, you know, I'm also getting images of me committing acts of child pedophilia. And this whole time, I'm just like, hold on a second. Like, I never think of these things, nor do I get aroused by any of this. Like, what the hell is going on? This is not my behavior. Like, and I can't switch from the negative to positive frequency because my empathy is down that much. I can't feel positive emotions right now. All I can feel is negativity. So with all that being said, you know, with this attachment that's going on, I experienced anxiety, high anxiety, high anger, extreme depression, sexual dysfunction, mental problems, severe obsessive compulsiveness, and the list just goes on. And prior to that, I was, just, I was fine, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And all of a sudden, my personality changes just like that. And in my 15 years of doing this, it's the most disturbing the most disturbing, traumatizing thing I've ever experienced as a paranormal investigator. So, with all that being said, I then go to a man that I've been going to now for nearly a decade, a psychic medium, Harvey Althaus, to get a reading done, to see what's happening here. You know, so I get this reading done, he doesn't pick up on anything. He, he scans my energy, the energy is just fine. And with everything that I'm experiencing, I'm like, there's no way he picked up on nothing. Something's hiding from me. It has, it, that has to be, that has to be the answer. Um, and like, unfortunately this just continues. Um, and three months after I got this happening to me, all of a sudden, um, my ulcerative colitis had come back from putting into remission 13 years ago before all of this. And then after getting into remission and doing so well, all of a sudden came back out of nowhere. And when you get signs of that disease coming back, like you'll know, like it just comes back slowly. This time it just came back. Like, like all of a sudden, I'm having diarrhea five times a day, turns into 10 times a day, and turns into 15 to 20 times a day. And all of a sudden, food tastes absolutely disgusting. Along with going to the bathroom 15 to 20 times a day, I'm also throwing up everything that I'm eating. And I was just eating like little specks of food because whatever was going on with me, like all food just tasted disgusting. 
like not just health food like i'm talking like delicious food like burritos burgers when i would have them stuff like that all of a sudden those things just tasted absolutely disgusting and my quality of life went down significantly and i'm becoming borderline suicidal at this point and i'm just like if I can't get back to where I was, what's the point? So I go to Harvey again. I'm like, okay, like we're gonna find, I'm gonna find out what the hell's going on here. Because like the fact that he picked up on nothing, something's definitely not right here. Um, Prior to my ulcerative colitis coming back about a month or two earlier, I could not sleep at all. I would go to bed about midnight and I would wake up at two o'clock every morning and I would just stay up. I would just lie there in bed and be going out of my mind. As time went on, I just continued to lose sleep. And two hours of sleep a night turned into 90 minutes of sleep a night. 90 minutes of sleep a night turned into 75 minutes of sleep a night. 75 minutes turned into 60, 45, so on and so forth. And I'm mentally losing my mind. Like I can't get proper rest. And You know, before that, I would had some acupuncture done to calm down. I didn't calm down at all. While I was getting acupuncture, I would get these visions of my own funeral happening with me lying in a casket. And, and as I was sleeping every night, I could feel something trying to like get into my heart chakra, get into my chest. And it just felt like this hatred that was trying to open me up and get inside. And I would have to call upon Archangel Michael and the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I'd say the Hail Mary and say Michael prayer every night. And I would just continue saying that prayer. So continue saying that prayer just so whatever this was I was trying to get in me would stay away from me. And <clears throat> a week before the more severe ulcerative colitis manifested, I had this nightmare, which I was told was an action, an astral projection of me being in Rome walking around, and then I get paralyzed all of a sudden. And there was this, what I think was something demonic. It was a man with wings and it he had a big belly, and he was crawling on the floor after me. And I couldn't move, so he starts crawling on my back, and he bites me in the back, and I could feel it, and I screamed as I woke up. It was absolutely terrifying. And throughout this whole time, along with those intrusive images, you know, I'd get the images of me hurting animals, me committing acts of child pedophilia, the submissive, abusive acts towards me, and images of me enjoying that. And as, I, as those things came to mind, I'm just like, I, I don't want to do any of those things. This voice would constantly contradict me as I thought that and be like, yeah, you do. Like, no, I don't. Like, I, I don't want to have sex with any of these people. Like, yeah, you do. I don't want to hurt kittens. Yeah, you do. I, I'm not a child molester. Yeah, you are. All this stuff, you were just suppressing it this whole time. This is the real you now. And, you know, my empathy is so low, this attachment took advantage of it and really like, it knew my psychology, and it took advantage of me, like none other. 
So at that point, it was just like... That was beyond rock bottom. I had had enough. And I was going to get out of this somehow, some way. Even though I was very much down and out, and the odds against me were more like a billion to one at this time. Hello, my name is Harvey Althaus. I am an intuitive, sensitive, remote viewer, um, psychic, medium, all the above. My first experiences with the paranormal started when I was around four. I'm 60 years old right now, so <laughs> you can do the math how long I've been doing this, and I'm still involved. I help people. I found out early on in, in my life that with these abilities that I, I never wanted as a child, but they never left me. They went dormant, you know, thank God for teen years, right? <laughs> you know, and you can just kind of just, you know, you have other things you had to worry about, football, dating, all that kind of good stuff. That was already awkward, so... Maybe my abilities sidestepped, you know, stepped out of the way to allow me to have those, um, those emotions and those roller coaster, you know, changing things. Uh, but they never left. Uh, every once in a while, when I was, you know, like a middle teenager, you know, things would, ha you know, I would see things happening or sense things or feel things. But it was nothing like it was when I was a child. But that all changed once I got, you know, once I graduated uh, high school. Um, I joined the United States Navy in 1981, served seven years. Um, and uh, when I was away from my family, away from my environment, away from my comfort zone, all of what I was set aside as far as abilities all came rushing back like a dam broke. You know, literally, hey, Hey there, remember us? <laughs> you know, still didn't want it, but it came to a point, I was about 19, no, I was, I was about 21, just before my 21st birthday. Because it couldn't run away from it, I just figured I'd run around and see what it was all about. You know, and I embraced it since. Um, and the more I faced it, the more abilities or latent abilities that I've always had, came online and it was through it was through discovery just coincidental accidental you know um you know uh interventions or uh stop going up to random strangers just out of the blue and just hey i need to i know you don't know me i don't know you but i have to tell you something and it might sound strange didn't mean anything to me but it meant everything to them right um and so here, here I am, you know, in my, in my just, just turned 60 in my sixth decade. Um, but like 50, 56 years, you know, actually dealing with it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how and why I got into it. Now the paranormal aspect of it, since I had always been in that as well, um, I just sort of figured out that I could co combine the two. You know, combined paranormal, I started investigating when I was like, I don't know, 14. Not really know what I was doing, but I knew I needed something to catch evidence. Otherwise, my family would truly think I was crazy. But I was trying to capture evidence, just anything, just to prove to my parents that I was right all along. And they were absolutely off base wrong, you know, about everything. But it was totally... Um, I was physically, emotionally, spiritually beat down a lot by my family. You know, my mother was extremely religious and my dad was whatever she said goes, you know. Uh, and as a child, you know, from the time I was four till I, about nine was the last time I stopped going to her because my mom, she never comforted me. She absolutely berated me. She belittled me. She demonified me, if that's a word, and swore to the high heavens that her only boy child, you know, out of, out of at the time six kids. At the time, I had um, 
you know, five sisters and it was just me. Um, and, you know, she spawned a demon and heaven helped that information getting back to the church, how scandalous that would be. So she went out of her way to beat it out of me by using, literally using, but depending upon what Bible she had available, she had the you know Gideon Bible and she had the King James. The King James was a hardbound Bible. So when she was really angry at me, and I guess the beatings wasn't hard enough for the Gideon, she would switch and start pounding me with the King James. You know, and did it leave impressions on me? Yes, and dents and scratches and cuts. You know, so that's that was the, neg- the negative part of it. But I have since learned to harness it for positive. You know, and I help. I've helped thousands over the decades. Literally, I mean, I can't even. And I can't even tell you how many. You know, in actuality, it's got to be over three thousand people I've read. You know, over 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 those decades. Um, and this is how you and I met. You know, this is this is this is how we met. Absolutely. So, Harvey, in doing your readings, um, you've been able to pick up on spirit attachments with certain clients, correct? Yes, certain clients. Yeah, and the first time... Which you happen to be one of them. Yes, I am one of them. And the first time I met you in 2013, I was having a problem. Um, I had gotten into a physical fight that I was able to defend myself from. However, I felt extremely paranoid and I had pretty bad post-traumatic stress so I thought hey that RV guy like you know this kind of feels like something's on me like and I'm a paranormal investigator it feels like this didn't quite feel like myself for sure and I was like let me see if he can pick up on something and you absolutely did so we removed the attachment through your directions and I immediately felt better so once again when this happened nine years later much worse you know i was having a series of health problems went to the hospital numerous times and they found absolutely nothing so who's the first guy that popped into my head when that happened you so i was like okay like let me see what let's see what harvey can do here and i remember the conversation and Strangely enough, I mean, of course, it's not that you did a bad job at all, but you just scanned my energy and you're just like, right. hey, Adam, like, you're, you're fine. I don't pick up on anything. So with that being said, I actually have a question for you about this. Can spirit entities or attachments, can they hide from psychic mediums? I want to say yes. I, I know for a fact they can move around physically. You know, they can move from one spot to another spot. And I, I found this out by accident. Um, a client's husband, who was a police officer, uh, he had been complaining about a really bad, stiff, sore neck for almost two years. It's like a year and a half. And now, mind you, Mr. Skeptic, good Catholic churchgoer, you know, the only that don't believe in ghosts other than heaven, hell, or purgatory, right? Mm -hmm. So um, he condoned what I did because I was helping his wife get into it because, you know, she had had some issues at her house and come to find out she had some stuff going on there. But then it intensified. Now, this was over a three-year period that I got to really know them. Uh, And anyways... um, but it was always about their house. And then we, we, we expanded from investigating her house to I take her out on some you know, local investigations with me. You know, she was very natural at it. So, and every time, and it was kind of funny because every time I went to pick her up, uh, you know, physically to take her to where we were going to investigate, her husband's going, don't bring that voodoo stuff home. <laughs> and yeah. at one point, she, I guess she had, she had been fed up with him saying this because he said it all the time. Right. She turned to him just right. before leaving and says, what do you care? You don't believe in it anyways. You know? And then his response was, well, yeah, well, just 
you know, don't slip up because if anybody brings something home, it's going to be you. Well, come to find out, he had an attachment, you know, from his work as a police officer. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, it was their story that I submitted to a haunting back in 2017 that they ended up doing. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was pretty intense. But I mean, for a police officer, God fearing, literally God fearing, straight lace, skeptic, right? You know, state the facts kind of guy. His entire world came crushing down when he found out that it was him that had brought something home for over a year, and it started affecting her his nine year old daughter at the time, who was you know as sensitive as well, but. She wasn't in, she wasn't, she didn't have to, she didn't understand or come to grips with what she had. And I didn't even know till this particular instance. So one day I was over there and uh, the, his wife was doing like a jewelry show thing out of her house and I was doing readings for people, you know? So he came up to me and he's just like, you know, stiff neck and, you know, he's a weightlifter and all that stuff. He thought like you. He thought maybe he had pulled something really bad. Well, he had been to numerous um, doctors, you know, and chiropractors, and nobody could find anything wrong with him. He even went and saw a neurologist, Mm -hmm. right? And then he saw a psychologist. Yeah. Nothing. So, but he just couldn't. It's always here. and, And he just... He said, it felt like someone was like grabbing my neck and twisting it from behind. You know, I said, whoa. So he, so he came up to me because he knows that I do energy, you know, stuff with energy. Mm-hmm. And he said, yeah, my wife's been telling me that I should ask you. And, you know, this is, you know, this is hogwash. But just to codify her, do whatever your voodoo stuff is. I wasn't even there on his neck for five seconds. And I went like this. Because I felt like this stabbing shock went through my body. And all of a sudden he went, and then he could move. I mean, he, he couldn't even do this. That was it. But to the right, this is all the farther he could go. The second that happened, he went like this. He goes, what the fuck did you do, right? Because he felt it too. He thought like it was a static charge. That's what I thought it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I said, yeah. I said, hey, look what you're doing. He goes, what? what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. I said, but I was kind of hemming and hawing and beat around the bush. And he says, well, I don't understand. I said, well, I said, I, I, I don't understand it either. I, it's like, I felt like I touched something that wasn't your energy and I startled it and it moved. And, he, and then he, cause he's sitting in a chair and he stood up and he goes, that's amazing. Oh my God. So he went to turn to the left and his left hip just shy of throwing him to the ground. Yeah. So what it did is shifted from up here, went down to his left hip. Now, now get this. I've been doing this long enough and I always tell people they need to totally with conviction, you know, before and after, especially after, you know, an investigation to protect themselves. And I always tell people, if you have any physical malady, pain, whatever, you have a weak spot, you got a bad, 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 whatever it is, protect those spots, you know, in your mind as much as possible, because those are your chinks in your armor and that spiritual energy. And, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, you know, and especially if, you know, these energy draining vampires is literally what they are. You know, they become accustomed to your energy and no matter what you do, well, if you don't know exactly, that's when you go to doctors and shit, they don't, they're telling you you're fine, right? You don't know what to do about it. And I got to a point, it was so dug in, you know, just like you, I drew a picture of what I saw. Mm-hmm. And it was a, uh, young male, 17, 18 years old, that had wrapped himself around him. Cause I, cause what happened was is, um, 
he was a police officer. He was working the late shift. He come upon a traffic, you know, um, uh, uh, a fatal traffic accident. Uh, it looked like, you know, guy just ran and smashed into the tree as fast as possible. Yeah. You know, blood trauma. Yeah. And I said, but I said, uh, I said, so when you stuck your head in the door to help, and he pulled him out. I said, I even told him, I said, did you pull, you know, did you pull this guy out? I said, yeah, I pulled him out because the car was kind of on fire. Yeah. And, um, okay. and I said, you know, I said, so, so I said, I, I can be wrong, but you brought him home. And what he did was, you know, you're a police officer, you're an authority figure. So when you got him to the ground, you know, he reaches up, he grabs you by here and that helped him up, but he was too afraid to let go of you because of what was happening to him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he goes, well, like I said, that's on, you know, TLC's a haunting. When he came to the realization that it was him that brought something in and not his wife, and then it took a priest. I, I never, as long as I've been doing this, I've never had to call a priest. And you know that I've always, you know, I've told you that. Yeah. But from yeah. what he, from what he was telling me, uh, when his wife told him to call me to get a hold of me, just like you, I thought I was listening to excerpts from The Omen or uh, The Exorcist. You know what was going on, mm-hmm. and um, I almost gave up on him. But I said, "Can I give me a day to consult with somebody?" And I have a good friend of mine. Um, he's a Catholic, you know, um, a Catholic priest, uh, Franciscan, I think. Anyways, uh, who got into this, you know, because he didn't want to be the medium that he naturally is. Right. But right. It, it enhanced it even more. Mm-hmm. So uh, with him, we were able to identify who this spirit was, why and how, how and why it got attached and why it was too afraid to leave him. You know, so it took some, I brought him in and it took some coaxing, but you know, in, in the show, it made it look like, you know, father opened the portal and he goes through it and it took a while because yeah. he didn't think he was worthy yeah. enough. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. But anyways, right. but your original question, I know I went off on a tangent, but I needed to explain, to explain, you know, to your audience, sure. you know, your question, what, you know, can they move? And I said, yes, here's my example. Yeah. So, absolutely. Go ahead. I mean, I can relate to what he went through too, because, you know, it felt like an organ inside of me was going to like rupture. I went to the hospital. I mean, they didn't find anything. And then it ended up just being a small chiropractic issue. And then he had swelling in my genitalia area. I mean, and it was starting to get painful. But then when I got checked out, found nothing. And on top of that, later later that week, the pain went away all of a sudden. And then I'm getting shocks in my heart. And I wake up one morning like, oh my God, I'm going to have a heart attack. So I went to the urgent care facility. And once I walked in there, like, I'm sorry, I need to go to the hospital right now. And they called the ambulance for me and brought me to the hospital and doing all the testing and everything, you know, like blood tests and everything, specific tests for heart, to see if I had a heart attack and it wasn't even close. It was like, right. the test score was like, you're supposed it's supposed to be like a 45 for a heart attack and it was a six. Right. I, I couldn't believe it. And, as soon as I walked out of that hospital door, it was like it, nothing even happened. Wow. But um, with all that being said, a few months passes, passes by and I haven't gotten any better. It's a matter of fact, I'm even worse now. You know, now I'm like thinking my ulcerative colitis has come back, but it's like colitis on steroids now. And I haven't gone to the hospital yet for this. And then it was like, you know, that first reading, it's like, okay, there, there can't be nothing going on. Let's, let's go back to Harvey. And I was like, okay, I forgot to mention that I was feeling lack of empathy. So I, you, I get a reading from you again. 
And I'm just like, yeah, I'm feeling like my empathy has plummeted, Harvey. Like, there's just nothing there. And then that's when it clicked for you. And that's when you started to pick right. up on the attachments. Right. And you were just like, oh, okay. I, you've picked up a hitchhiker. Right. And it, and it did. It, it had hid originally from me. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. And then, and then, um, you know, uh, I had asked you, you know, when we had that second conversation, I had asked, you know, I had asked you for some time so I could, you know, really get into it. And while I was into it, I started getting visions of a possibility. I mean, not more, more than a possibility a plausibility. So I drew a picture because that's the only way that, you know, me explaining is one thing, but I felt that it needed some sort of illustration to give you an idea because of where the pressure points where you were feeling the crushing sensations, the crowded, you know, so I drew this, this female spirit wrapped around your body, you know, from the back, Yeah. you know, yeah. holding, uh, I think, I think I drew it. To, I mean, I have the picture I'd have to look for it, but, you know, the one arm reaching over and crushing you right here, you know, with the hand, you know, the heart area. And then the legs wrapped around and, and they're cross, you know, cross legged in front of you, pushing, you know, pushing down, pushing in and crushing you down in those areas that you were experiencing issues with. She had black eyes and um, it was like anger and anxiety on steroids. Yeah, big time. That's what I felt from that whole thing. And of course, when you drew the picture, I'm like, yeah, that's that's creepy. Right. Creepy as all hell. And then you said you should probably see a shamanic healer as soon as possible. I I, I did say that because I because you know I'm very limited. What I what I do, I mean, I'm very good at what I do, but when it comes to stuff like this. Like I said, I never had called, I never had to contact a priest before, you know, and there's a priest. I never had to call a shaman before or a shaman or have a person or even tell a person to go see somebody. Yeah. And here it was. Yeah. I found the picture. Could I share it on my screen? Yeah, absolutely. Here it is, people. The black eyes, and that's, you know, it's not necessarily, it's a, a really bad representation of Adam, but. You know, uh, you can see what I was, this is what I was talking exactly about. Yeah. See how the arm comes wrapped yeah. around over the top and the legs crossed around you? Yeah. And she was yeah. You know, so. So that's what, when I was walking around that mausoleum, that's what happened when I forgot to disengage from spirit and uh, protect myself. It was just the one time that I didn't do it. Yeah. That's. Only takes once. Yeah. yeah. Only once. Yeah. And with all that being said, Harvey, like, you know, that's my purpose in making this. Is it happened to the cop? It happened to me. Very real. It's a very real thing. And sometimes the hospital and the therapists, if they're not working yeah. out, no, because they're thinking, well, obviously he's having a neurological episode or something. Maybe he just wants attention, yeah. you know? It's like, if those, but, if, if those two aren't working out, then it's probably a spiritual problem then, more than likely. You know, it's, it's like, it's like you know, you, you as a, you and I as paranormal investigators, as investigators, what do we do first? You know, we, we try to, here's that term, debunk the obvious, yeah. right? Yeah. So once you, get all the obvious reasons out in the open and it's still not explaining what is going on option two <laughs> or it's out of the ordinary for sure thus making it paranormal because it's not normal you know so when you strive to go to the lengths that we do as paranormal investigators to debunk obvious things and your debunking was going to the doctors yeah you know i can just imagine how you felt when you were feeling like crap 
the doctor's telling you, well, I, I'm not quite sure what to tell you, but physically, we don't see anything. You know, yeah, very inside of you, we, you know, the blood test and stuff, we don't, we don't see anything out of normal range. Yeah. You know, frustrating and frightening at the same time. Right. You know, you know and then here you are, you know, losing all that weight and just, you know, being sour to the world and no empathy, you know, just, yeah, it's not, it's not fair, you know. So, so going to the shaman, so, you know, uh, how did, how did that help? Uh, tremendously. Well, it's the difference is night and day, Harvey. Like, if you were inside of me, like if you were being me, you're like, yeah, holy shit, yeah, this is not you, man. Like, we've, you've been to a lot of places, Harvey. I've also been to a lot of places. I think you can agree with me when I say the most frightening thing is one of the most frightening things you can experience is losing yourself. And just knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. And just like holy shit, yeah, yeah, this all this behavior is not me at all. Right, right. But at least at least you were able to you know, you engage with the knowledge that it is, you know, and accepted that, yeah, this is not me. You know, some people they would have missed those clues. You know, and just and the spirit energy saying, Don't worry about it. You're, you're perfect, but you're, they're crazy. We're not, you know. So yeah, making exactly. it making it normal a normal thing, yeah. you know, for for the afflicted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, now we're here, and I would have to say, no, I would put my recovery at about an eighty-five to ninety percent rate now, in terms of which is. In terms of Which physical, is a lot better than it was. Absolutely, and I'll take it. I mean, yeah, there's still some a little problems going on, but I mean, I will definitely take this over right. where I was. Right. And you know, I have to. You know, you felt me before, then you helped me again. So I have to thank you very much for that, Harvey. You basically, you were part of the team that saved my life. Well, I mean, wow. <laughs> Wow, um, no one's ever said that to me before, you know, for helping them doing what I do. So, you're welcome. Hello, my name is Holly Marie, and I am a shamanic practitioner. And is what that entails is everything from soul retrieval, chakra balancing, past life regression, emotional trauma release, and entity extraction or removal. How I got into this work is a pretty long story, so I'll keep it short, but I grew up very, um, very ill. I was sick all the time. I was depressed. The depression went into suicidal tendencies, and nothing was helping. Antidepressants didn't help. Nothing helped. So finally one day, I was at my wit's end and I went to um, a small massage place and just said I needed help and they handed me a shamanic practitioner's card and I went and it didn't seem to really be doing anything and I later realized that it was um, working on unseen levels and from there I became this shaman student and I now practice it because the modality is so powerful and I teach it. So one of the main things that I want to talk about today is entity extraction and many 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 of us go through trauma in our life and when we go through trauma it fractures our aura field or a chakra and that creates kind of like a portal or an entryway for an entity. And the entity can be anything from somebody who suddenly passed away and got stuck in this dimension. Uh, usually they'll get stuck in this dimension if they died very traumatically. If they don't believe they have died, they think they're still living, 
or if they were under heavy, heavy medication when they passed over. And a lot of times uh, is what people don't quite understand is there are five levels in the shamanic uh, lineage. There's five levels to the upper world. So many times people will think a loved one has been crossed over, but they are literally in one of the first four levels of the upper world and we want to move them into the fifth and when that happens spirits can become attached to other people they can become attached to their loved ones or like i said if you're just going through any sort of trauma and you have that fracture or that lower frequency they can attach to that and so with my clients is what i deal with often is um either paranormal activity, if we're dealing with something more sinister or demonic, things can get really out of hand, such as um, TV shattering. I've dealt with that. I've dealt with, um, you know, things flying around the room, signs being ripped off the door, taking the paint with them. Um, I have dealt with possession, which is not very fun at all. I've literally had people levitate off my table, going from paralysis, um, shape-shifting into the entity, and then back to themselves and literally like blacking out and levitating off my table. So uh, it can be a lot of fun. It can be a little scary, but uh, these things are very real and they do exist. They absolutely exist. Um, many times when we have an entity attachment, we may notice sudden mood changes, sudden um, thoughts that aren't ours, sudden fear, sudden paranoia, anxiety, depression. These are all, if these are new habits or they suddenly come on, these are all signs that you could have an entity. Also, um, if all of a sudden you become a gambler or any sort of addictive habit that you didn't have before. It could very well mean that you have a spirit attachment. And I remove entities from people all the time. Um, when we remove entities in my, in, in my realm of shamanism, when we remove an entity, we are always sending it to the light. I've heard of people just banishing entities away, which is interesting because I heard of a story of a woman that banished an entity off of her husband and the entity jumped to a neighbor that the cops later shot because he went into a psychotic spiral. And so when you're dealing with entities, you have to be very careful how you're removing them making sure that they are always going to the light and oftentimes entities will be very taunting when i'm removing them from a person they will yell they will call me names um, they will resist so in the shamanic we use a tracking stone um, and eventually we will get the entity to the light We've also dealt with more benign entities that are just kind of lost souls that need to be crossed over, but they can also do things. I've had cases where people's clothes are getting taken off the hangers, thrown on the floor, and um, you know the radio is going on and off, and, and I go into the realm and I check in, and it's, it's very benign, it's just too, you know, two old ladies in one case that just wanted to be crossed over to the light. Uh, oftentimes, nurses and people who spent a lot of time in a hospital with a loved one who's dying or very ill will get entity attachments. One, because there's a lot of death in hospitals. And two, if you're a loved one and you're sitting with somebody that's ill, your vibration is getting lowered because you're concerned or sad, uh, you're in fear. All these are ways to draw in entities. And 
other occurrences that can pull in entities as well is um, a lot of alcohol or drug abuse because that again lowers your vibration and entities are everywhere um, they they will come out of nowhere and, and it just attached to a host because they need that life force energy so um, oftentimes like I said if if you're in a position where all of a sudden something's just not right or you're you're craving something you've never craved and you start to crave it over and over and over whether it's you know even down to sex addiction if that just all of a sudden came on it is more than likely an entity uh, a lot of times suicidal thoughts can be entities um, it is not yours and a lot of times we just stop and ask ourselves is is this mine is this my thought and if it's not your thought entity attachment Children can get entities. Uh, for instance, I have a son and when he was about, I think when he was about maybe six years old, he started wearing this headband and like a girl's headband and he started acting very strangely and I, I didn't equate it to an entity attachment because it was my son and I'm a new mom and it just didn't even cross my mind. And then one day I was at work and, and my husband called me and he's like, our son is acting so weird, you have to come home. And my husband is the most chill, even keel person ever, never gets agitated at anything. At that point I knew something was off. And so um, my husband is also trained in the shamanic realm. And I got home, sure enough, my kid was just acting really bizarrely, just very strange, um, very like withdrawn and almost kind of, he was acting like a girl. So I was able to be the surrogate and my husband removed, he called the entities in from my son and somehow two teenage girls had attached to my son. As soon as my husband cleared the entities from me, because we called them from my son to me, which is something that we can do in the shamanic work, as soon as those entities went to the light, my son went back to normal and he never touched that headband again. So. I mean, there's there's so many stories um, of this happening over and over, and you'll see the behavior once the entity is gone, the behavior of the client or the person goes back to normal. So I've removed so many entities from people. Um, I can do it over the phone. I can do it in person. Um, a lot of times if you're going through a big city where there's been a history of um, any sort of violence, war, uh, sex trafficking, anything like that, a lot of times those entities will attach onto you as well. And um, it's just, you know, a lot of people will will blow it off like it's not real because you can't see it, but it is absolutely real. Now, when I'm dealing with actual paranormal investigators with equipment, um, I will go in with my pendulum, I, I'll use a pendulum, and it's very fascinating because I, where I used to live in California, I would go around with a group of these um, female paranormal investigators and they had all the equipment. And I would always stand in the back and I would use my pendulum and I never once had a discrepancy with my pendulum to their equipment, which is really good validation for, for both them and myself, right? Because the pendulum, you want to make sure it's real and to check it with their equipment and get zero discrepancy is pretty fascinating. Um, the one thing that I did find using my pendulum is I could move through information faster. I could ask 
questions faster for whatever reason than they could with their equipment. So that information would come through. Um, there was another instance where it, um, an old storefront was a brothel way back in the 1900s and um, this place became very, very haunted where boxes would fly, um, you know, the, the merchandise would be swinging around. So they called me in to clear it and um, as I was clearing the basement, you could literally hear screaming and you could hear like footsteps running and um, the lady upstairs, the store, the shopkeeper upstairs, like the lights were flickering back and forth, right? And and so we, we cleared that building as well. And it's just fascinating to go through this process to, to see, to feel, right? You know, you see in your third eye, but to feel the presence, the, um, the cold coming through, right? Or just the audio of the footsteps and the screams or the lights actually flickering. So um, there's also an element too where you have to protect yourself. So in the shamanic, when I'm moving, uh, removing an entity in the shamanic, we always lock our wrists, right? That, that it's an etheric message that we can't get the attachment. So there are many, many aspects to this fourth dimension where we are clearing, crossing over, um, you know, doing the extraction. And many times too, if you're ill, if you have some sort of sickness going on, you may want to check for an entity attachment. And um, if you, you do work with anybody, make sure that they are removing the entity to the light, always to the light, never banish it just to another person. So throughout this whole process, I came across shamanic healing and was looking up healers through a search engine and Holly had come up. So I decided to contact her about it. Um, so pretty much for Holly, I was just another client. So this is the norm for her entities being attached to people, um, stuff like that. That's just what she does. So I was just another client. I mean, there's no offense taken at all, so... So, I come in through the door, and, like, what was your first impression? Did you see an attachment on me, or did you just... He just looks like a regular guy. You just look like a regular guy. I could tell you were in pain. I don't see attachments till I really kind of get into my session. But I could tell that you were in a lot of pain and that you were suffering. That was very apparent. Yeah. And then I told you everything that happened to her, like, what I was experiencing like what you were telling uh, people about uh, your work as a healer, like the stuff, the images I was getting in my head, um, anger and anxiety on steroids, um, undesirable, unwanted sexual images, um, animal abuse, child pedophilia, lack of empathy. So, so throughout this process, I'm a very empathic man. And once I, the taffron came on me, my empathy just plummeted. So therefore, all that anger, anxiety comes in. I start getting all those images and I'm behaving in ways or getting thoughts of behaving in ways where I'm just like, whoa, hold on a second. 33 years of living on this earth, I have not once thought about these things. Something's very wrong. Exactly. And you're lucky that you have the awareness to understand that because many people just go through their day-to-day -day life getting totally consumed. So yes, when you came in, um, I, I could tell that you were really, really suffering. And um, you know, a thought just occurred to me. It's like when we're having these images, right? We're literally seeing the entity's memory because those images have to come from somewhere, right? And once that attachment comes, you're it's like you're seeing their timeline almost, which is, is very interesting. So once we got into the session, um, that's when I was able to see, and do you want me to just go into, that's when I was really able to see, and you did tell me that you had um, 
crossed lines that you weren't supposed to. Like, you literally crossed caution tape. Um, and that caution tape was there for a reason. And, and it really makes me wonder who put the caution tape there and why. It's almost like there was an energetic barrier, but I'm just speculating. So once I got in, um, the entity began to speak through you and they're, they're very good at um, trying to shame the extractor, right? You know, calling me bitch and a bunch of profanity names. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a fake, you know. It's, it's like... It's, it's like textbook standard for them, right? Um, so I thought it was a male because a lot of times the more aggressive entities are males. And as, as I begin to see her, I, obviously I realized it was a her, and then I could begin to see where she was, and she was in this very dark tunnel way, a very underground, right? And these underground tunnels are real and they have been around for years and they still operate. It is not fake. It's real. And she was actually trafficking children and women in the sex trade. And I could tell that she had handlers. Uh, it was just very obvious. She was doing her job. She was under threat. And um, it, 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 I could just almost see the children too just there kind of like a Shanghai type scenario and um, this this entity had so much guilt and pain and shame that I could not remove her until I literally cleared it out of your chakra field once we begin to clear the guilt was really really big once we begin to clear that guilt that's when she began to loosen up and we're finally able to cross her over into the light you know, but also before that, I was trying to shoot one of our videos called Walking Amongst the Dead at that mausoleum. And the people I contacted about it were like, like, oh no, we're not, we're not allowing people to film in the mausoleum. And then I, and then I asked a second time, like, sorry, Adam, like the answer is no. And then I went ahead and did it anyway and that makes me think okay i had loved ones protecting me it was um because sometimes as paranormal investigators you can't take no for an answer but then there's times where it's like oh somebody was protecting me well i mean that's a hard call to make too right yeah. like when when you're it, they may have been protecting me well, no, not that, but taking no for an answer. When you're investigating anything, you got to go through the red tape. Yes, that's right. And that's what I was doing. Right. But the fact of the matter is, it's not so much that I went in there, it was that I forgot to disengage with spirit as I left there. And that was always something that I had made a habit on in over 10 years of doing this. And I forgot to do it that one time. Why do you think you forgot? Because my instinct was telling me to get out of there. So flight or fight or flight mode was on. Interesting. Yeah. Can so. I ask at what point you had that get out of there moment? Like what <clears throat> happened? So when I crossed the red tape, walking down the mausoleum, I turned the corner and it, there was no lights. It started to get darker. And then there was another corridor that I turned and it was just completely dark. And that's when my instinct acted up and said, Adam, you gotta go now. And I didn't even argue. I was like, okay, yeah, like I'm leaving. At any point, did you feel some sort of attachment get onto you? Did you feel like a breeze? Or for instance, I was at a concert once and I literally felt this entity go right into my scapula, right into my shoulder blade, and it, it, it attached right to my second chakra. Okay. Like I felt it go in. Did you feel anything like that? It was colder down there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but <clears throat> like I said, it was fight or flight mode. So I just immediately got out of there. And I mean, it was an eight story mausoleum. So I mean, I had, yeah. I had a lot of walking to do before I got to the exit. So I was on 
like the second floor and like the exit is on the fifth floor. So I had to go up a lot of stairs and a lot of hallways to, to leave. And then once you left going into the next day, how, like when did you start to notice something wasn't right? When I crossed the Selwood Bridge. Uh, it was like, oh. um, why do I feel different? Something's wrong here. It was, that's fast. Yeah. And I was at the gym, I was like, I do not feel like me. Like, I, the Adam from yesterday is not the Adam today. Okay, so this was in like a few hours that you felt. Yeah, so how I knew that this wasn't like, how I knew this wasn't me was like, there were no signs from the past. Like, you know, I didn't abuse animals. Like, I don't even hurt flies stuff like that and I was like changing like that yeah. and it was like it was too fast and too sudden and it was just a huge shock to me do you ever think that's why people just go ballistic in public and mass shootings or yes I was on the verge of just losing it in public yep like I was literally driving, I would stand in the line to get lunch and I'm like ready to fall on my knees and start screaming. Yes. Do you think that if you didn't have your background in paranormal activity, do you think that you would have caught that no. or do you think you would have just no. right? I would not have caught that. See, and it's it's so important that people have some sort of spiritual or paranormal background they don't have to do the deep dive but to understand when all of a sudden you're having these images of hurting animals and you've never had that before something happened yeah and extreme sexual preferences yeah yeah so so that oh yeah sorry one one thing that i wanted to mention before i got there it was like my emotions were manipulated like none other. It was just like, I know this isn't me, but it's like, it's actually like, I actually want to do these things. See? So I, I worked on another person uh, who was having these tendencies towards, he totally in love with his fiance, started having these tendencies towards men which he's like that's not me and then what kind of happened with his children he never did any harm but that's that's when he called me and it took him every time he tried to pick up the phone to call me this entity would tell him that like if if he calls me he's gonna get hurt his family's gonna get hurt and and that that was kind of his red tape he finally just said screw it and called and we took care of the problem well, I mean, I almost called the cops on myself because I was like, uh, it got to the point where I'm like, um, you need to arrest me and like have your guns drawn when you arrest me because I'm like at the point of sprinting towards you and wanting to hurt you. That's how bad it was. See, and that's just heartbreaking because you see all these people, you know, going on these shooting sprees or, you know, hurting animals or, you know, killing their family or whatever it is, right? Why are they doing that? They just all of a sudden flipped, right? Yeah. It's, it's not just because all of a sudden you're full-blown mentally ill. No, that, no, it doesn't work that way. Something attached to you. Something attached to you, and that's what people really need to understand. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, if I may add, um, keeping it as benign as possible, every single person that has uh, not made it through any sort of COVID experience has not crossed over. And I literally believe it's a soul trap. And so these, these people are passing, whether it's from trying to 
protect themselves from this virus or actually catching the virus and dying. Um, those souls, every single person I've dealt with or to cross over, they're not crossing over. Not one single COVID victim that I have had to deal with because I'm crossing them over for, you know, somebody knows of somebody. And of course, I'm always asking permission. Every single COVID victim is still stuck here until they're crossed over. And what that tells me is that it's a soul trap. And then there, these souls are like attaching to us, lowering our vibration. And this all goes into the fourth dimensional spiritual warfare, but that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Because, I mean, this was so sudden, this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, it would make sense that they didn't cross over. Right. Because 2020 out of nowhere, mm -hmm. this hits. Like right. That. Right. So everybody also got their vibration lower. Yeah. Unemployment. What else? Social shutdowns. Yeah, so, and riots. Schools. People losing their minds. Yeah, just fear, 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 which lowers the vibration, right? And then they come in and attach. People destroying cities. Right. And statues. All of it. Yeah. You know, and just, but that, that bottom line fear. But, but moving back to, to your story, um, I, I think it's key, if, if anybody gets anything out of watching this, it is that sudden onset of something different. And if all of a sudden you think of something violent, whatever, but if you continue to have these thoughts and they're not yours, th there's something going on. There's something very sinister going on. When you were extracting the entity from me, or the spirit from me, like all of a sudden it was like another spe a person was speaking through me to you. Yes. And in here I'm like, oh, what the hell, I'm not saying this. So we're trained, and this is how I, I teach this as well, is is I'm putting your subconscious or your 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 conscious mind, I'm giving your conscious mind a task. And so that's why I'm asking you to count backwards from 100 to one by threes because all of a sudden you're distracted. While I'm also asking you to allow and let the entity speak through you, right? So you're distracted, which allows the entity to come up and speak. Interesting. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's strange, it's, it's weird. Well, and I also remember that I was crying a lot and I was also like how am I crying like this I believe that were, was her tears the end which is what I thought too yes because it was very strange I'm just like well like I don't feel like that now another thing I don't think the entity was from that long ago. I'm kind of sensing it was just from around like the 40s or 50s. It wasn't very, it wasn't an entity from like 200 years gone down. It yeah. was in the 1900s for sure. Yeah. I remember I was holding the stone and you yanked it out of my hand. Why did you do that? The crystal? Yeah. So, in the shamanic, so we, we use a uh, medicine bundle and this is this is a whole nother process that you make as you go through the uh, medicine wheel. But how we extract fluid entities or thought forms is we take a double terminated quartz crystal, and you want to have a crystal with less inclusions. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in your hand and I'm literally going to use uh, all Mesa carriers have a tracking stone. This is my tracking stone that actually broke during entity extraction. I should replace it, but um, this was a entity extraction I did from Portland. The client was in Reno and the stone busted. So 
So I'm going to take my tracking stone and I'm going to feel where the entity is in Adam's body, right? So I'm, I'm just, I'm going to feel it, right? In the shamanic, we get uh, rites that create light out of our fingers. So we're going to use our fingers of light to comb through, right? We're going to find hot spots on the body or cold spots on the body and we're going to track the entity through coaxing it to come to the light in his hand right once the entity is in the once we feel it go into the crystal i kind of like shock the client right so i sort of like i kind of just hope oh, and I, I grab the crystal out and then we we put it in here as fast as possible this opaque covering because it keeps the entity in you can hold up to five entities in one crystal. You want to um, release it after three days. How you release it is you're going to take uh, Florida water. It's a um, it's a clearing spray that we make with uh, white alcohol and essential oils. You're going to loosen both ends by heating it on a candle, right? And then you go out and you blow the entity to the light in the four directions and make sure you're avoiding telephone wires or other buildings or trees. You're blowing it straight up into the light. Um, and so that this is what you use. That's why I yanked it out and gave a little scream. Right. Because then you shocked back. Yeah, I didn't.
Ashford, what is that? Uh, we got a lot going on here. <laughs> Have you felt the presence around you at all? Yeah, I think you could say that. Um, something so was that, removed from it. Something was removed that, from like this entanglement. Um, would, you, would you just say something was removed from you? Yeah, but it, it still feels like something's there. Like, I do feel a little bit more like myself, but it still kind of feels like something's lingering. Yeah, because I, right away, I drew in the back. I said, oh my God, I'm feeling heaviness behind you. Uh, there's a pressure. Okay, let me see what that pressure is. I started drawing all these squiggly lines around you. I said, oh boy, you got something around you. Uh, there's also some sense of loss. Uh, obviously, you've got questions, but I wrote that down. And I'm wondering, okay. okay. What is this I'm, I'm sensing from a distance? And then that's why I ask if you've got something around you, because there is something around you. Um, this thing yeah. is, it's almost like an entanglement, uh, but it's still keeping some cords attached to you from a distance. Hmm. I don't know what this is yet, but let me, uh, <laughs> Or you're sick or whatever you're dealing with something you try to add to 
to it, so I'll have you over if you just do this. No, it won't. I mean, you're stupid. I go on consciousness, so it'll be even worse because I'll be all consciousness instead of body and consciousness. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. you have to fight it and just say you don't have permission. Um, I had a Navy SEAL that had these thoughts constantly going in his head. And to validate he wasn't crazy, uh, I took out a recorder and I felt two entities around him and I properly described them to two locations he'd been, one in Afghanistan and one in Somalia. And what they were, what he said they were saying, I took out the recorder and I captured them saying the exact same thing. Wow. Played it back to him, his girlfriend, and his girlfriend's daughter. They screamed because they heard it on the recorder when I played it back. And they realized, holy shit. And they looked at him and he just shook his head going, yep, because I knew I wasn't crazy. I said, this proves you're not yeah. crazy. Hearing these voices, they're not. And the question then becomes, how come they're not? It's very simple is our brains, okay, and this is what you can do too. And this is why sound frequencies, I feel, are very healing, not only from a physical standpoint for the human brain, between the left ear and the right ear, because I've done research on this and implemented my own protocol for my brain injury from 2009 from concussion that I had. I hope it healed up and it worked. But also in dealing with these voices, is that these voices find out what your brain frequency is, there's a thousand different set brain frequencies, okay? And this comes from a bio a neuro, neurologist that is based on bioneural feedback, neurological communication within the brain. They do what's called a QEEG, okay? And a QEEG is where they hook these electrodes up to your head. It's not painful, you don't feel anything. And they just monitor your brain. When your eyes are open, your eyes are closed, you breathe heavy, whatever, and they monitor the changes. It tells you on the various parts of the brain which brains are over-amplified and which parts are under-amplified because our brain sends frequencies, electrical, neurological impulses through the synapses to communicate for various parts of the body. It tells mm -hmm. you which areas are damaged, tells you which areas are over-amplified or under-amplified. Now, that puts up a, a complete ratio or a number system that they can then equate and compare to similar. Now, they said there's over a thousand different categories, but they mm -hmm. can't possibly do that. So they, they narrowed it down to 100. Now they've narrowed it down to 20 or 30, which means that you can have 100 people in the room and everyone has a different brain frequency. So that's like everybody's tuned in, like he specifically stated, to a different radio station. So what happens is the entities figure out your brain frequency. They broadcast mm -hmm. to you and nobody else can hear it because they're on your channel to understand Interesting, yeah. Okay, now this is back yeah. to science. I have like a 20 page report of my own brain showing mm -hmm. the brain mapping that they did and showing that I'm highly sensitive from 10 hertz to 14 hertz, which yeah. scientifically explains why I can hear EVPs and audio when other people can't. I can hear yeah. frequencies when you don't even see it on the wave, but you amplify it and there it is. So, yeah. I'm telling you this because you have to focus on your brain frequencies, okay? You can do that by listening to audio programs that go to 420 hertz, whatever hertz, you know, to help uh, meditation, to help clear the brain, to help calmness, anxiety. You can find them on YouTube for free, okay? And you can yeah. find them throughout the internet. What type of frequencies do I need to listen to to calm the mind, to lessen anxiety, stuff like that, all right? What that does, here's the amazing thing, okay? And this is where, where you have some scientists that know a lot about the brain. I'll tell you, our brain is actually a computer system. It's a receiver. It sends signals and receives signals. So what do you do with a tower or if you're on a specific channel and you have someone else that jumps on your channel, you change the channel. But hey, you're on the same channel, get off this channel, right? Well, they figure out your channel. So one of the things to not have to listen to them anymore is you change your channel. How do you do that? Well, you retune your brain. Mm -hmm. Okay? One way to do that is I love to, to clear them because I get attachments all the time for stuff that I do. Yeah. And I've got a wood chime, just a wood block, okay? The energy meditation chime, but on eBay, Amazon, Amazon, whatever you want. And I do this occasionally when I feel heaviness or something around me. 
Yeah. And what I do is I'll do it right in front of me and I'll use it like soap. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll hit it and I'll put it over my body to where the frequencies go through my body. What that does is other entities of consciousness that are not of a aligned frequency such as us, they hate this type of tone because they're basically frequency, they're energy. So when you're creating a pure harmonic tone with intent behind it, like I'll say love, light, peace, happiness, and then I'm listening to that tone, I close my eyes, and my brain is waving with it, but I'm thinking of love, happiness, whatever, that travels along that frequency, it's almost like a cleansing thing of a vibrational energy. Mm-hmm. So by doing this repeatedly, okay, creating that moment, few moments, you do this minute, two, five, 30 seconds, whatever, and you do this as a ritual every day or for a couple of days, whatever, until you need it, you have to clear away that frequency because you're basically saying, you know, you're, I do not grant you permission to be my frequency. You know, get off this channel. And then you yeah. use this to do that, okay? It's incredible. I mean, I've had entities, all right, attached to me as soon as I do this, you know, I go to the breathing thing, like when I change it, like, I'm 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 like, so I'm like, oh my God, you know, this works. So that is one thing you can do. The second thing, like I said, find some of these audio programs on YouTube or whatever and put in what, you're, what, what are your ailments. You know, you're, you're dealing with anxiety, you're dealing with attachments, whatever it might be, and find audio for that. And you'll find some audio clips you can listen to. Some are like, geez, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, eight hours. You know, they're all very put on some noise canceling headphones and go, hey, this is my time to realign with my body. And you sit there and listen to it. And I, for me, it's like now a vacation it has become part of me, of my meditation process to get away. I can't just sit in a room, close my eyes and just sit there and meditate. I need something to induce me into that loosening state. So I will listen to audio. Audio, you are going to see in the future as we're moving towards everything for healing will no longer be pharmaceuticals, drugs, and stuff like that. They will start going towards vibration and frequency, whether it's in light or sound. They're already doing it with light, with certain therapies. Infrared therapies, you know, the ultrasonic, all that. But you're gonna see them yeah. get into audio and everything else to start healing. So you can get a step up on that and start doing that for yourself. You're gonna find some great peace, like, oh my God, my mind is clear. I feel so peaceful. I fall asleep because I'm in such peace. And I'm sure you have a hard time sleeping because your mind is all over the place. Yeah. That was, this will help yeah, you clear that mind and relax it so you can go into a relaxed state of consciousness and get some really deep sleeps, okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, let me write this down. <clears throat> so you want to do some audio techniques. We'll get into your questions here. Listen to frequencies. Oh, wow. I got something yelling in my head right now. So have you, have you had something like where it yells in your head? Yeah. Because I'm getting that right now, whatever this is. It's like screaming and yelling at me. Um, yeah, because, I'm, because I'm figuring it out. Yeah, it's so mad. It's like a, a bipolar or manic depressive girlfriend. Um, screaming, yelling, I hate you, what are you doing? How could you do this to me? I need to... I'm getting this like, oh my God. Um, yeah. I, I, okay, hang on, because I'm having a hard time writing this down. Uh, China Rock, who's to clear space? Hey, Chris, are you getting a ringing sound on your phone? That is my chime. Did you hear that? Okay. Oh, okay, I got yeah. you. Okay. Is that what you heard? Yeah, that's what it was. I thought something was okay. hearing. No, no, I'm doing that to clear the space so that we can talk. Okay, I feel better now. Um, John Beck used to clear space and remove entity. Okay, let's get into this then. Um, I got an idea. Some of the things you've been dealing with. Now, did you lose someone? Has someone passed away recently? Uh, 
no, nobody, nobody died. Okay, then why I, I wrote down loss, um, there's a sense of loss. Well, this whole process, I feel like I've lost my sense of self. Okay. Um, yeah. The whole thing started in September. Um, it, uh, I was walking around a mausoleum, you know, um, tuning my instincts for paranormal stuff. There was an area where my instinct was drawn to. I don't think I was supposed to go there, but I did it anyway. And then my instinct was telling me to get the hell out of there, and I forgot to disengage with the spirit. This was back in September, and I think that's how I got my attachment, and ever since then I've been experiencing physical and mental health declines since then. Okay, okay, that makes sense. I've been there, listen, I've been there, okay? Uh, yeah, a lot of people have been there, I've been there. Um, it's terrible, you don't know what to do, but I, there's plenty you can do. Uh, when we were the first, first location we did for the second season of Help, we went to the Corn Exchange, and I collapsed twice because something's trying to take me over. And I'm like, why the hell did they be able to do that? Well, I brought it home with me. And I went into real negativity. You know, go kill yourself, go do this. Hated everything, was getting angry. I called up my uh, teammate and I said, dude, um, it's got me, it's got me. I said, that I don't want to fight it. They're like, no, you gotta fight it. What do you do? I said, I don't know. I just don't have it in me for some reason. I go, no, they're tricking you. So he says, you know better. I said, I know better, but it's like, I can't, I feel like I'm in this, Bad. like I can't I can't move and uh, so I pushed and I said okay what can I do well I'm gonna just do humor so I started watching comedy comedy little clips of videos and stuff Kevin Hart and all these other comedians and stuff I started laughing and I said all right I'm gonna I'm gonna go on which I never really used I went on snapchat and I used some of the filters to create funny little voices and faces and stuff and uh, I started making these little videos and I was laughing my ass off I posted them on Instagram. It was called Flumball Boogie. And I just created this and I started doing this. And I did this all day long. Like eight hours, eight hours, whatever. I was creating all these funny videos and stuff. Next thing you know, it was gone. The entity was completely gone. Why? Because they don't like love. They don't like light. They don't like happiness, laughter, joy. They don't like any of that. All right? So I took positive emotions and positive experiences and I instituted on the easiest way, which was humor. And with humor, I was able to remove them quickly and they didn't come back. And I could not believe how well it worked. I was like, wow, I felt like I'm a completely different person. And I just continued to do those little things for a little while and I still once in a while I might jump on there and do it. But it worked. And so you have to do the opposite of what they are. And it's hard to get to that push because you feel so heavy and so tired and so fatigued just irritated, but as soon as you start doing that, you, all right, here's the one thing that I learned, and this is a statement that I say, you are in control of your thoughts. If you aren't, then who is? Yeah. Okay. You're in control yeah. of your thoughts. If you aren't, then who is? I used to get in fights in high school and college because I saw my dad get in fights because there was a voice in my head that said, go do this. So I listened to it because I didn't know, you know, that was me. You know, that seems logical. I'll just go fight this person or I'll just create a scene or I'll throw this or I'll do whatever. And I did that. And I got in trouble here and there. And then I even said to a counselor in college, I get these voices, what's it telling you right now? It's telling me to punch you in the face. It's telling me to scream and grab you by the neck. She goes, well, do you want to do that? I go, no, I don't want to do that. So yeah. I'm listening. I said, because it's in my fucking head and I can't get it out of my head. Yeah. And I realized it was negative entities trying to ruin my future. Mm -hmm. And then I was at a bar. And this is where I, I, I realized, oh my God, two different situations. I was at a bar and I'd been drinking. And we were next we were next to a strip club that was next door. My friends were in there. And we're at this one nightclub that's right next door. It's like the top nightclub in Chicago. And I said, I gotta go in here because my buddies in here got my keys to my car. He said, No, you can't come in. We're closing in 15 minutes. You can wait for him. I said, I'm not gonna wait for him. I'm gonna drive all the way home. 
And so I started arguing with him, and I was ready to fight him because I was pissed off. Don't tell me what to do because I've been drinking. And as I took a step towards him, because I was going to punch him, and I'm like, there's a part of me, the, the actual part of me in my head, like, what are you doing, Chris? He's doing his job. Stop. And as I stopped with my next step, this entity came out of me. And my eyes lit up. And he looks at me like, what the? He didn't see it, but he felt something go in between us. And I saw this thing go, and it went out of me. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I look and I go, I am so sorry. He goes, dude, he's like, bro, man, I thought you were going to hit me and you would come at me. I said, I was, but it wasn't me. And I said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I, and I leaned against the wall going, that's because I was drinking. Because I was drinking, I was in a lucid state that it took over my body because it could easily, because I wasn't in control completely. And I said, after that, I said, oh, no, I'm never getting like that again. No way. And I realized, holy cow, the second time was another person that had a, a drug addiction. Well, he, used to, he told me, was, Chris, I have a hard time. I, I, I take ecstasy a lot. Why are you doing that? And I know it makes you feel great and everything, but why are you doing that? He says, I don't know, I just do it, but I think I got a demon attached to me. I said, why? He goes, well, I went to go see the Passion of Christ, and I got a heart on when Jesus was getting whipped. And I'm like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I'm sitting there going, okay, maybe this guy's just crazy, right? And yeah. all of a sudden, in my mind, I projected to his subconscious, I'm looking at him in his eyes, and I said, if you're really there, prove it. All of a sudden, this demonic entity lunges out at me to try to scratch me, and then goes right back in like a parasite. And I step away from going, holy cow, he does have an attachment. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my, oh my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I tell him? So then I told him, listen, you have an attachment, man. You gotta lay off the drugs. You gotta take care, you gotta clean yourself up. You have got to start doing positive, you know, I told him everything else to do. And I realized, man, we have a responsibility to be in control of our thoughts and to make sure something else doesn't gain control. So we have to realize that we have to pay attention to addictions, to things that we do, people we hang around with, because if we get a similar mindset or we get into a loosening stage to where our body-mind connection is loosened, these things could come in and take over. So we have a responsibility to ourself, okay? Yeah. The biggest thing is like, when I would sometimes get these things in my head, and it still happens, because once they've made access, they know how to get in again and again and again. So you have to fight them, repeatedly. You have to yeah. say, hey, whoa, you don't have permission to be in my head. I'm not gonna punch my cat in the face or step on its head. What are you yeah. saying? Go get the heck out of here. I go, I love my cat. So I do the opposite. I go, no way, I love my cat. I'll do everything for my cat and all animals. And I love God and I love Jesus and I love this. And I start just saying all that stuff and it's like, ah, you know, and it runs away, right? Because you want to do the opposite. You say, no, I'm in control of myself. That's not me. Yeah. So if you're not in control of your thoughts, then who is? That's why you have to control your thoughts. But I don't get those voices like I did in college because I didn't do anything about it. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I do now. So it's like, no, man, I, I protect my thoughts. If my thoughts start to waver or become something negative, then I know, okay, something's trying to get in. Something's trying to get access. And that's how I pick up a lot of stuff, too, because I'll feel that. Mm -hmm. So it's like something just said, kick him in the head. You know, I just got this right now. It just popped into my head, kick him in the head. And I know that they do this. And they'll tell other people in the street, like, go punch this person. Do the knockout game. Just punch him. Be funny with your buddies. You'll love it. And they go do it. And these, these gang members or kids and this whatever, they go do it. And I'm realizing that these are negative spirits telling them to do that. And when they do it, they're giving more power to that negative entity to control them more and more and more because now they've granted permission to that thought. They've aligned themselves physically with that act that was visually stated or auditorially stated to them in their mind. So, you have to consistently balance yourself by either having a major definite purpose, a desire, of what you want to do in this world, focusing on that, that not only improves you, but also contributes to others. And when you constantly focus and you do that, you put yourself into a physical vibration that they just don't want to penetrate because you have a purpose. They hate yeah. you when you have a purpose. They like the people who are lost, confused, or struggling. So, um, it's basically getting control of your thoughts and getting control of what you do, creating a schedule, a plan, and following that because you have a greater purpose to accomplish that. And when you do, you feel good about yourself, other people are appreciated, 
and you're on your way to accomplishing something, which they don't want you to do. They want to distract you. They want you to fail. They want you to fall. They want you to not want to do anything so that they, as a parasite, can continue to, you know, take everything from you, absorb you. Yeah. So... So after all that was said and done, I noticed that the this attachment had gone, but now for step two of this problem, it's like it left residual energy behind with me. So the intrusive thoughts and all that other stuff, I mean, they had gone down, but I mean, I was still dealing with that along with an unhealthy amount of anxiety. So I went back for a second time, and then you suggested past life regression yes. for this problem. And what I found out was very interesting. So 500 years ago, I was in either India or Egypt, and I had slept with the prince's or king's wife. He walked in on us, the thing was, the wife never loved him, forced her into marriage with him, but she was in love with me. And after that whole thing went down, I was ordered up into his chamber with his men, and he had put this curse on me. And then after he had put the curse on me, his men then beat the hell out of me and that's how I died in that lifetime. So we did, so I found that out and then went into the chambers and the contract was agony so we tore that contract up and made happiness instead. Um, do you think that the, was that the curse contract agony? Was that from him? That was from the past life. Now, I. T to be clear, I'm not sure if, I think the entity was separate, but I think it was feeding the same emotion, right? Sure. Because we all have past lives, so you, you, you had this entity attachment over here, and you had this karmatic piece from the past life. I feel like they both fed into like one nasty river of anxiety and sure everything else um and the in the chambers that you're talking about in the shamanic realm in my lineage which is peruvian we go through uh four different chambers we go in to see uh when there's a traumatic past life is what happens is you make a contract at that point of death and within that contract the contract's made to protect yourself but it's also made out of ego so it's limiting so mm -hmm. the protection you're giving yourself is actually limiting you the dna is holographic it passes through lifetime after lifetime in the hologram of the dna so you keep playing out that contract right yeah. so so once we get that contract we we need to witness it being destroyed right yeah. i'm the witness the having a witness makes it more powerful then we write a new declaration we also get the soul piece and we get a gift of divination and so you're you're getting you're 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 getting that whole healing it's it's a all-encompassing healing so after that the second healing session this past life regression that anxiety that was just not going away it finally went down. I mean, like, that was the worst anxiety I'd ever felt in my life. And then, like, it's gone down, like, 80-85% since then. And along with that, with my Crohn's diagnosis from last year, you know, not to be too much information, but, I mean, this is part of irritable bowel diseases. That day, I was at, like, 9 to 10 bowel movements a day, and now I'm sitting around 3 to 4 now. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I Isn't mean, that amazing? A lot of people, they will focus on the physical only or the mental. We have a belief that 99% of all ailments come from 
some sort of energetic, whether it's this life, a past life, it comes uh, an ancestral issue. It, it comes from disruption within the body, an emotional dis-ease, right, which could come from many things. So when we clear that, the body begins to respond. So even with somebody, um, moving off subject, but when somebody comes in with, um, you know, heart disease, right, and it's hereditary, we move back and see where the ancestors broke their heart or had their heart broken, right? And, and a lot of people with... Um, like obesity issues, when we go back to the ancestors, it's because their their food was stolen. And so they were malnutrition. They could only live off potatoes and cabbage or, you know, like they had no real protein. And, you know, obesity can be a sign of malnutrition. So we go back and we, we mend that through the ancestors. Wow. Who would have thought? <clears throat> yeah, so Holly, I want to thank you through this whole thought process and especially helping me out. I mean, I'm glad I found you because I, like without you, without Harvey, and without getting that reading from Chris Fleming, I have no idea where I would be today. Like, probably not a good place. It's, it's an honor. It, it's an honor. One thing I do want to say really quick is to piggyback off what you said about people need to look at more than the physical. Um, you know, most times people just end up on a slew of medications when they don't need to. Yeah. People go see the doctors, they go see the therapists. Not saying that you shouldn't, but the point is, if these two things are not working, then that leaves one more thing, and that's the spiritual. Absolutely. And a lot of people disregard that because pretty much because they think it's not real. Right. And it's as real as the realm that we're living in. Right. Well, you can't see your Wi-Fi, but you know it's real. There you go. Right? Absolutely. I mean, your, your radio waves come from somewhere, right? And spirits, the same thing? Absolutely. So, well, thank you for having me. And thank you thank for you. finding me. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm glad you were there.